All right, I think let's get started. So as you may notice, I am not Tiara. So I'll, I'll be taking over some of these calls from now on. My name is Brittany. My pronouns are she, her, and as a Navajo woman, it's important for me to acknowledge that the, the land that I'm on, and I'm on occupied Tohono O'odham land, and I encourage all of y'all to go to native-land.ca after this call and check out what land you're on if you don't already know, just to honor that. Um, yeah, so with that, hello everyone, and today we have our oceans webinar. Um, and we have some great speakers and some good stuff coming. And I think, did I mention, I'm the Saving Life on Earth campaigner. <laughs> so, you know, it would definitely be a disservice not to mention, you know, all the amazing biodiversity in the oceans and lakes and rivers and creeks and all the various bodies of water that cover this beautiful earth that we live on. Um, I think there is a slide with a photo <laughs> on it um, that kind of gives a little introduction of me um, and on the right side of it, I, oh, okay, here we go. <laughs> Next slide. Oh, there it is. So that's me at the Grand Canyon with a sign in Diné. Um, but so on the right side of the, the screen, there's a picture of me surfing. I grew up on the ocean, um, South Shore, Long Island. I grew up surfing. This is actually me in Puerto Rico. In Bukio, on the east side of the island, but I was spending most of my time on the west side of the island in Rincon working with a group called Salva Rincon to protect um, the Elkhorn coral in the uh, Tres Palmas Marina over there from a mega hotel and casino that was trying to build um, on the land less than like a mile away from there. So that's, you know, I've been around oceans my whole life. It's really important to me. So I figured I should mention that just so you all know a little bit more about me and why this work matters so much to me. Um, yeah, and then on the bottom photo, native-land.ca, you go to that website, type in your zip code, you can see all sorts of cool things about the land that you're occupying right now. So a little bit of what's going to happen today. So the chat is disabled because we heard from you all that it got kind of distracting, but there is a Q&A little button that you can drop your questions in and they will be recorded and we'll go over that at the end of this call. Um, and then tomorrow, if we don't get to your questions on Slack, uh, you can join our Slack channel and Julie and Tiara, I believe, will be there to answer any questions that you have. And then one more thing at the end of this call, you'll get a link to an action that you can take today, which will be telling the EPA to enact a moratorium on permits for new plastic plants and up the regulations that allow these plants to keep polluting, you know, these bodies of water and the earth in general. So with that, um, that's me. This is how the call is going to go. I'm going to pass it to Delia. Hi, everyone. My name is Delia. I am based in San Francisco, which is occupied Ohlone territory. Um, and as an activist and an organizer, I would just like to take this opportunity in my introduction to commit myself to the struggle against systems of oppression that have stolen indigenous people of their land. And I also wanna stand in solidarity with the movement for black lives and the fights against systemic racism and white supremacy. Um, but I can tell you a little bit more about myself. I'm a campaigner on the oceans team. I work to protect our oceans from a myriad of issues they face, including offshore drilling, fracking, and plastic pollution. And I grew up on the East Coast and fell in love with the ocean at an early age. My parents would call me a fish because I wouldn't ever want to get out of the water during our summer vacations. Um, and I thought that the Atlantic Coast would have my heart forever, but now that I live on the West Coast, I have to say that the Pacific Ocean is beautiful and definitely knows how to win someone over. <laughs> I first got into campaigning and organizing on my undergraduate campus where I was part of the divestment movement. So we were urging our university to divest their massive endowment from the fossil fuel industry and stop profiting off of the climate crisis. And then soon after college, I ended up working as an intern at the center, fighting Trump's plans to expand offshore drilling in our oceans. And I now work as a full time on staff uh, with a focus on fighting the plastic pollution crisis and the petrochemical build out that is underway in the Gulf and Appalachian regions. And I think it's really important to fight not only to protect our oceans, but also connect oceans issues to the fights 
for environmental and racial justice that are also ongoing and all interconnected. So it's good to be here with you all this evening. Um, I'm so happy to be here. My turn, I guess, right, Brittany? Great. I just want to start by saying thank you to everyone who joined a little early and heard us bantering. This is my first <laughs> Zoom webinar, and I hadn't realized that you all could hear us and see us and listen to all of our machinations about volume and star signs and whatnot. So <laughs> I'm Julie Teal Simmons, and I'm a senior attorney in the Oceans Program at the Center. And I'm actually based in Boulder, Colorado, so pretty far from today's oceans. Um, but I did grow up in San Diego on the coast and like others spent a ton of time in and around the water and really came to love and find a lot of solace uh, at the beach and going into the ocean. And when I went to college, I actually decided to create my own major because of my interest in the ocean. And, and I created a major called Marine Ecology and Pollution. Um, and in thinking about next steps, it really became clear to me that I could do a lot of good with a law degree. So that's kind of how I ended up on a law school trajectory. Um, when I'm not working, which feels like it's rare right now because things are so heated with this administration, I'm outside with my kids trying to hope that I can instill a love of the ocean and nature and all life on earth in them. And that, I think on the slide, you can see a picture of me with my daughter at the beach last summer. She's uh, inspecting a sand crab at La Jolla Shores in San Diego. And um, the other random photo, I don't know why I decided to pick that one, but it maybe some, some of you might recognize it. It's the eyebrow of an elephant seal. I got to uh, volunteer on the Farallon Islands some years ago, and I just fell in love with those animals. So it seemed to represent my my love of all of the elements of the ocean, even the, what might seem mundane to others, um, really fascinates me and, and brings me great joy. So I'm happy to be here with you all today. And we actually thought we might start with a quick poll. Um, I'm hoping that some of you or all of, many of you got to see um, the movie, um, The Story of Plastic. And just so you know, that link that we sent you is actually active until I think it's 1130 tonight. Pacific time, if I'm correct. And if any of you don't get a chance to use that link and want to watch the movie, just contact us. My email's on the slide there. We can get you a new active link. So I think Karina is going to pop up a quick poll. And there might be a few of you that do not have access to your mouse and buttons right now because you're calling in just with a phone. So I'll read out the question and the answers. And if you can just select um, one answer here, that'd be great. So the question is what your biggest concern is about plastic. So what is really the focus of your interest in this topic? And the choices are one, the buildup of waste in our oceans and landfills, two, the impacts of plastic pollution on marine life, like entanglement and ingestion, three, the fossil fuels and related infrastructure used to produce plastic, four, the public health impacts of plastic, and five, the perpetuation of the single use and throwaway culture. So we just thought it'd be interesting to kind of see where, where this falls out with all of you calling in. We got a really good turnout tonight and just interested to see what brought you here in terms of concerns. And I think the answers, we'll give you a little bit of time to pick one, but I think Karina can actually make them visible to everybody. So she'll do that as soon as, as, soon as they're available. And just, just to take it, another second on the story of plastic. I thought it was so, so well done and it really covers so many of the issues about this plastic pollution crisis. And um, today we're gonna hit on some of those, but obviously at the center, our big focus is saving life on earth and the focus on marine wildlife and biodiversity, but there are just so many interwoven issues here that are important for us to address and hopefully we'll get to several of them on this call. So do we have some answers coming in? We're almost there. Um, looks like things are starting to slow down a little bit. So we'll give everyone a few more seconds. All right, there are the results.
a lot of people had also put in the chat that um, they wish that there is an all the above button as well. Which, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, all of these issues are super interrelated too. You know, plastic is such a big and bad deal, like all around in so many different ways. But I want to ask you, Julie, how does it impact wildlife? And what does plastic have to do exactly with extinction? Yeah, good question. And unfortunately, you know, the impacts of plastic on wildlife are just all so clear these days. And I feel like almost every day I'm reading a new scientific article or a news piece on um, another source of plastic or an impact of plastic or a terrible, you know, image of an entangled marine mammal. So just to start kind of from the beginning, a really conservative estimate of how much plastic's entering our oceans is 8 million tons per year. So um, I think on the slide, yeah, there's a photo there of a beach in Jakarta. It's just an enormous amount of waste entering our oceans from a lot of different sources. Um, but something very important about the, the waste ending up in the ocean is that an, uh, an estimate is that 90% of it is single use plastics. So I think that's you know, a really important fact and it shows that we can really do a lot to reduce the amount of waste entering our oceans. Um, in terms of sources, it, you know, obviously there's the, the, the clear sources of waste, which is just litter. Um, also discarded and lost fishing gear is a huge source of plastic pollution. And then you've got wastewater and stormwater discharges that are bringing plastic into rivers and oceans. And then there's some less obvious sources of pollution. And again, coming back to this, just new information coming up all the time. There was a recent study that came out that said tire dust was a huge, a huge problem and a huge source of plastic pollution. So just the wear and tear of driving um, emits and, and creates particles that then end up running into our oceans and rivers. So plastic has really pervaded our entire world and our lifestyles and our ecosystems, unfortunately. Um, another really big source of plastic that we're very focused on is called pre-production plastic. You might have heard the term pellets or nurdles. Um, and I actually have some here. Let me see if I can, if you guys can see that. So mix in with just regular, you know, pieces of wood and sand are little plastic round pellets of plastic. And this is plastic that is actually lost either from facilities that manufacture resin, plastic resin, that will then be shipped off to be molded and formed into bottles and bags and car parts and tubes and tires and playground equipment. So it can be lost from those facilities that make these nurdles and it also can be lost by the facilities that have taken in those nurdles to make the products. And it's an enormous source of plastic pollution. And what's really insidious about these things is that you might have been able to tell by just looking at them, they look like eggs and larva. And so a lot of species are taking them up, eating them, thinking that they're food um, and they're obviously not food. So, and the other, really dangerous thing about plastic in the environment and these nurdles is that they have a tendency to adsorb other toxic chemicals. So cancer causing chemicals, um, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons and other nasty things that nobody should be eating. And so they're doubly toxic if they get into the, the marine food web. Um, another kind of alarming statistic I wanted to share is that a, a recently, well, pretty well known estimate is that by 2050, if things don't change, we're gonna have more plastic in the ocean by weight um, than all the fish in the ocean. And I know that's something you've probably heard already, but I think it really brings to bear just how pressing this problem is and just how much we're talking about. It's hard to kind of visualize 8 million tons, but to think that we could have more plastic than fish kind of really makes it clear just how big this problem is. And in terms of where it's ending up, Yes, it's in our oceans for sure, but the other alarming thing is that it's been found in Arctic snow, it's been found at the top of the Pyrenees, um, <clears throat> it's in, in the ocean, it's at the deepest parts of the ocean, it's been found at the Mariana, at the bottom of the Mariana Trench. And um, scientists are also finding that as plastic breaks down, a recent article I just read is that ocean plastic can actually end up back in the air. Scientists recently tested ocean breezes and ocean breezes have plastic particles in them. So we're starting to aspirate them or, and breathe them in um, from you know, land-based sources, but also even from the ocean. So it is literally in our bodies and in our total food chains. And um, I don't think anyone likes to think about that, <laughs> but uh, they don't have a lot of science yet on what that's doing to us. But I, I think we all can understand that ingesting plastic and the toxins that stick to it, it can't be good for us. 
So in terms of actual impacts to wildlife, though, there's some really obvious ones. We all have seen those pictures and, and entanglement and ingestion are huge problems. So I think the slide has a picture of an albatross. That's an albatross chick that was fed plastic by its parent that thought, who thought it was food. And that's a huge problem in the Pacific Islands. Um, they're feeding their chicks plastic and they're dying. 97% of all al albatross chicks in that area, it's Midway Island, were found that were found dead had plastic in their systems. I think probably many of you also heard last year about a Cuvier's beaked whale that was found in the Philippines. It was still alive at the time and it died when they were trying to um, resuscitate it and it had 88 pounds of plastic in its intestines. So it's just really physically killing them in very obvious and visible ways. And there's um, some statistics on this slide too about just how many species have been found and tested and have had plastic in their systems. Um, but there's also less obvious impacts on wildlife. So for example, that is a zooplankton right there in the middle um, off the coast of Monterey. And zooplankton is that foundation of our marine food web and they've been finding plastic now even in our zooplankton. So it really has gone just all the way through the food chain. Um, and then the last picture is Senator Udall holding up a credit card. And I just wanted to make the point and share the point that it's impacting wildlife, but it's also impacting us. I mean, I consider us part of wildlife, but um, he's holding up that credit card while he's introducing the Break Free from Pol uh, Plastic Pollution Act this year. And his point and what a new article has supported is that each of us is on average ingesting a credit card's worth of plastic. So that's five grams of plastic or 2000 particles. So again, it really is also harming us and posing a threat to us. Um, I think I have another slide just to mention the connection. Brittany, you mentioned impacts on wildlife, but also the focus of our webinar series is saving life on earth and extinction. And I think the bigger threat to wildlife and to us is just how linked plastic pollution is to the climate crisis. And um, when I started working on this issue, I didn't even know this, but I didn't think of it, but plastic is literally fossil fuel based. So 99% of plastic comes from fossil fuels. And so it's creating water and air pollution at every step of its production cycle. So there's some well pads there, fracking well pads for fracked gas. And then, you know, all the way until it ends up in our environment or landfills or oceans, at every step it's causing harm to wildlife and to people. Um, and I think in our country, it's really the abundance of cheap fracked gas in all of our various shale deposits is driving this big boom and it's also a big driver now of climate pollution. So the, the image on the slide is um, an image that the Center for International Environmental Law produced last year in a really good report that they did. They did two, several great reports last year on plastic and health and plastic and climate. And they, they um, measured that right now, the plastic production cycle is the equivalent of 189, 500 megawatt coal-fired power plants operating at full capacity. And that's expected to basically triple by 2050. And it's fossil fuel companies that we all know, um, like ExxonMobil, Chevron, Shell, they're trying to basically move into this petrochemical. I mean, they're already there, but really they see an opportunity before the door closes that they can make a lot of money producing plastic from gas liquids. And they're right here in the US planning a massive boom of facilities. They're already underway. Um, they're building dozens of new facilities right here in the U.S. and already have invested $202 billion in over 300 petrochemical projects in the U.S. alone. And that is expected to increase our plastic production by about 40% probably in the next decade. Um, and if you think about that, that's just a staggering increase in production. So again, the, and producing that plastic is just very energy intensive and very polluting. And this picture on the bottom of the slide is actually a um, shell ethane cracker and polyethylene plant that is under construction right now in Pennsylvania. And something else I didn't realize when we started working on this is just how massive these facilities are. They're enormous, they're mega cities of industry. There's multiple plants on each site. Um, and you can see it's right there on the river. They like to locate on rivers and bays for transporting their product. So it's a real pollution nightmare, honestly. Um, and all of this pollution, you know, from the extraction to the, to the disposal destroys habitat for wildlife and wildlife and our special places. So 
Um, and I think Delia is going to touch more on how it's also hurting people and communities where these facilities are located. And those tend to be um, communities of color and low income communities around uh, the US. Yeah, I think it's just wild to like look at these photos and see how big this, you know, refinery is and, you know, really think about how it's not even just the plastic, but the production, the afterwards, you know, and just how all of these cycles are linked to extinction and, you know, the destruction of not only the earth, but everyone who lives on it. And yeah, it's a lot to take in, but you know, there are some solutions and things we can do. And a lot of people I hear talk about recycling as one of the big ones, but what do you think, Delia? Thanks, Brittany. Um, yeah, recycling is often presented as the solution and what we need to pour more money in to fight the plastic pollution crisis. I wish that were true, that we could recycle our way out of this problem. Unfortunately, plastic pollution and the entire plastics life cycle is a much bigger systemic issue. Uh, we know that by and large, recycling systems have been failing us for a long time. Of the approximately 6,300 million tons of plastic waste already produced globally as of 2015, only 9% has been recycled with 12% incinerated and that leaves the remaining 79% accumulating in landfills and the natural environment. So water bottles, straws, utensils, food wrappers, packaging, you name it, single use plastics items account for approximately 40% of plastic use. And in the United States, we produce more waste than our recycling systems can keep up with. Many products, especially single-use packaging, aren't economically feasible to recycle, especially now that China has enacted strict regulations on imports of plastic waste and other recyclable materials. This uh, contributes to the problem and, and why products that we think um, that we think would end up being recycled when we put them in that blue bin actually end up in landfills in our environment or being incinerated um, because by and large the systems are failing us. And recycling has been pushed by the plastic industry as a solution to the plastic pollution problem we face, but it is a false solution. If recycling were as effective as the public perception around it, we might not be here today talking about these issues. Um, and it does not get at the, recycling doesn't get at the environmental impacts that come with plastic production of the plastic life cycle. So it's more, it's more than just mitigating plastic pollution downstream. We have to take into consideration that the plastic pollution crisis is also the climate crisis. And by 2050, plastic will account for approximately 20% of fossil fuel consumption and greenhouse gas emissions. This tells us that plastic is threatening on a global scale. So recycling has been sold to us as a solution, yes. Um, the plastic industry and corporations have tried to put the onus on consumers of plastic products to deal with the plastic pollution crisis. And I do think it's important to continue to recycle and make decisions about which products we purchase as a consumer. Um, it's also important that the plastic industry starts taking responsibility for the plastic that they are producing, not pushing the problem back onto consumers. And the scale of the plastic pollution crisis we face means we need to tackle it at the source. And that starts with stopping the amount of plastic we're producing and putting a halt to the proposed expansion of plastic production facilities that Julie mentioned before here in the United States. Yeah, thank you for that. And you're 100% right. You know, while recycling is important, we do need to, you know, really hit the plastic industry at the source and hold them accountable to the destruction that they're doing. And that brings me to my next question. What is the center doing about this? Well, luckily, we're doing a lot, but we're working in really great coalitions to try to tackle this from all angles. And I think something that distinguishes our focus from some other groups is that we're really focusing on this production piece, so the kind of the upstream piece, and um, not so much on cleaning it up downstream we're addressing it downstream but we also think that's hugely important so we we try to be good allies in those efforts as well um, when I think about our specific work on this I think about it kind of in three big buckets so I think there's a slide there yeah there we go so the first one would be working in coalition with allies and other groups across the country to demand nationwide policy solutions to this problem so 
couple of, of examples that the center has been working on. Last year, we submitted two petitions to the EPA um, requesting that they update their Clean Air Act and Clean Water Act regulations that apply to plastic facilities. They have been operating for decades under the same old standards and obviously there's a the boom in production and a lot more pollution that we're seeing and this pellet discharge issue. So we submitted those two petitions. We had uh, about 300 organizations sign on to each petition. So it was a really great coalition effort. And just to give you a sense of one of our asks, a big one in the Clean Water Act petition was that EPA should be implementing a zero discharge standard for plastic pollution from facilities. Um, and there were a host of other regulations that needed to be updated on toxic chemicals and other, other issues. So um, we're waiting to hear a response from EPA on that. And we have another petition to EPA actually under another statute called the Resource Recovery, sorry, Resource Conservation and Recovery Act or RICRA. And that is a petition to EPA seeking that they ban or heavily regulate some plastics as hazardous waste under that act. Um, and so we're waiting for responses on these petitions. And then if, if we don't get a response that could become a lawsuit at some point, if they've delayed too long, we can go to court and ask them to compel the agency to respond to our petitions. Another big example is we've been look, working a lot on legislative solutions. So what we wanna see in legislative efforts is of course like bag bans and straw bans are all important and great steps, but we really wanna see leadership on um, limiting plastic production and also extended producer responsibility provisions where the producers of plastic have to deal with this issue of the waste they're producing. Um, to date, they've kind of wanted to blame consumers and countries that don't have adequate waste management systems for this problem and really think the burden needs to be shifted back on governments and companies. Of course, we should all do our part to, to reduce waste, but it's, it's not fair to be blaming consumers for this problem. Um, and then finally, environmental justice provisions. We've been really pushing hard to get those included in these bills as well. So I mentioned earlier, Senator Udall, he along with uh, Representative Lowenthal from the LA area introduced the Break Free from Plastic Act this year from Pollution Plastic, Plastic Pollution Act. <laughs> um, and it's really a groundbreaking piece of legislation. If you are interested, I encourage you to go and take a look at it. They've been holding webinars on the act as well that you could join. And it really starts to introduce some real solutions to plastic pollution, not like just cleaning it up once it's already in the ocean or incinerating it, which has a whole another host of issues. So we were really happy to engage in that act. They opened it up for a wide stakeholder engagement and got a lot of great input from um, a lot of different groups. Um, so then the second bucket, stepping away from those nationwide solutions, we're also challenging specific permits issued to new plastics plants. And I think Delia is gonna talk about our big um, focus right now. And um, so we don't want more facilities that are polluting built and they're destroying natural areas and creating havoc in these local communities. And then also we're trying to enforce existing permits and make sure that once a facility is built that it's actually complying with its permits. So we've brought several cases under the Clean Water Act where we found companies discharging plastic into waterways uh, most of our cases so far have been in California, but I know other groups are bringing cases in Texas and South Carolina on similar issues. And then the final bucket is kind of the catch-all bucket, other creative legal solutions. We're always looking for new ways to tackle this problem. We're working right now on a 2020 executive uh, plastic action plan in coalition with other groups too, that the president, whoever that might be, um, can use their executive authority to do many things on plastic pollution as well as climate pollution. We have a companion plan that was released last year on climate. And then we're, uh, another good example is um, we've sued the state of Hawaii and have other states that we're focusing on to list and protect microplastics polluted waters as impaired under the Clean Water Act, which is a first step for getting measures in place that can help clean up um, pollute, plastic pollution problems in these in these um, waterways. And then one other example I think that was kind of is a creative <laughs> approach is that we petitioned the EPA a few years ago to classify Turn Island, one of the Hawaiian islands, as a Superfund site because it's just it's so polluted with plastic that just collects there in the Pacific and contaminates the island and it's a really important rookery for um, tropical seabirds and is home to other endangered species like the Hawaiian monk seal. So we're always looking for that, you know, the 
how to protect endangered species also from plastic. But it's it's pretty incredible how much companies can kind of wash their hands of responsibility. So we hope through all of our activities and efforts, we can really crack down on, on in, increased production and also just the pollution problem. Um, and again, I just wanted to give a shout out to our allies. We work closely with a lot of groups in the break three from plastic movement and we couldn't do this work without them. Thank you for that, Julie. And I'm curious to hear more about, I know working at the center, I've heard about it, about the, the, the I guess, battle with uh, Formosa and the work you've been doing, you know, there. So Delia, take that away. Yeah, thanks, Brittany. I'm actually going to, before I get into the Stop Formosa fight and sharing about our story, I'm going to share my screen with you all and um, let you watch a quick one minute video that our amazing comms team put together. Shout out to Dipika. Um, one second. To give you all more context and then I'll get into it. Um, I will share the link for that video in the chat. Um, it's not on YouTube right now, but I can share the link to the tweet. Um, and so thanks, Brittany, for uh, giving, yeah, asking me about our Ocean's flagship campaign, which is the fight to stop Formosa. Um, so the center is involved in the fight against Formosa because we believe we need to fight, like I was saying before, plastic production at the source. And we stand against the environmental injustices associated with petrochemical facilities like Formosa Plastics. So Formosa wants to build one of the largest plastic plants in St. James Parish, Louisiana. And we work closely in coalition with Louisiana-based organizations and national organizations to, to fight this proposed plant and the toxic air and water pollution and environmental racism that will come with it. The Formosa project is part of industry's plan to increase plastic pro production over the next decade and Petrochemical companies like Formosa are turning that oversupply of fracked gas in the US into plastic for single use packaging. Um, and so this fight in particular, this site where the Formosa plant is slated to be built is in the fifth district of St. James Parish, which is a majority black district already overflowing with industrial facilities. Within a 10 mile radius of St. James, there are already 12 petrochemical facilities that are already online, um, already existing. And St. James is one of many parishes along the Mississippi River in Louisiana, between Baton Rouge and New Orleans. Uh, these, these river parishes are overburdened with industrial air pollution, so much so residents call the industry corridor, the industrial corridor, Cancer Alley. Um, and frontline community leaders are, are leading this fight. Specifically, we work very closely with an organization called Rye St. James and Rise and their founder and executive director, Sharon Levine, are leading the fight in St. James for clean air, clean water, and clean soil. So it is, it's truly an honor and a privilege to work alongside in coalition with organizations like RISE and other Louisiana groups like Louisiana Bucket Brigade to fight uh, these important fights for environmental justice. 
And the fight against Formosa is important for a number of reasons, like you saw in the video. Formosa is a known bad actor with a long, long history, decades long, of environmental violations. Their petrochemical facility um, that already exists in Point Comfort, Texas, has been illegally discharging thousands of plastic pellets and other pollutants into the nearby waterways for decades. And so most recently with that plant that is in Texas, um, there was a, a civil lawsuit filed against Formosa. They were sued for their continuous pollution into the waterways. And the federal judge for that case actually labeled the company a serial offender for its egregious Clean Water Act violations. And in the settlement for that lawsuit, Formosa settled with frontline environmental groups for $50 million. That's the largest Clean Water Act settlement ever reached with community groups against an industrial polluter. And that $50 million settlement will go to local environmental restoration projects. Um, if you go to the next slide, Julie and I were lucky to have, oh, sorry, the next one actually. Julie and I, I'll, I'll go back to that one and talk more about RISE too, but um, I just wanted to say Julie and I were lucky to have the opportunity to bring the evidence used in that lawsuit from Point Comfort Texas to our coalition partners in Louisiana so they could use them for a demonstration to educate the public. So we actually drove the pellets from Point Comfort to Baton Rouge and you can see a picture of us on the left here uh, sitting in the U-Haul with all of the evidence. And we called it the Nurdle Brigade because the plastic pellets that Formosa plants produce, seen in the right picture here, that's Julie's hand holding some of the nurdles. Um, those, yeah, those are called nurdles. So we called it the Nurdle Brigade <laughs> on our road trip uh, through the Gulf. And uh, I just want to be clear that it's not just in Texas. Formosa has a long history of polluting everywhere they have operations, including Taiwan, Vietnam, and Cambodia, uh, to name a few other countries. They also have a plant in Baton Rouge, which has been in violation of the Clean Air Act every, every quarter since 2009. So the bottom line really is that Formosa's top priority is production of plastic and the profit that comes with it. It's not for the community. It's not for the safety of the workers they employ. Um, and we've seen this everywhere that they've operated or have facilities. So fighting Formosa is, is bigger than fighting the plastic pollution crisis. This is also, as I alluded to before, about environmental and racial justice. Um, if you go back, yeah, thank you. <laughs> the industrial pollution communities in Cancer Alley face daily is killing them. Uh, that's why it's egregious that the proposed Formosa plant would double the toxic air emissions in St. James Parish. Um, it would double the toxic air emissions that, that residents in St. James Parish are already exposed to. So folks who live in Cancer Alley are also, as we know now, um, more likely to suffer from COVID-19. Studies have confirmed that communities living with serious air pollution are more likely to get sick or even die from the pandemic. And the coronavirus has shown what we already knew to be true. Black and brown communities bear the brunt of environmental injustices. And these are the same communities who are suffering the most from this deadly pandemic. If this proposed project was not already egregious enough, um, if I haven't convinced you to take the streets marching to stop Formosa yet, uh, it's also worth noting and mentioning, um, it's, it was recently discovered that the plant would desecrate historical graves belonging to people who were enslaved on the plantations that once operated on the site. And many residents in St. James Parish can trace their roots to this plantation and others like it. So for all these reasons and more, we've been actively fighting Formosa, working in a powerful coalition led by amazing leaders um, of Rice St. James who are in these two pictures right now and their founder and leader, Sharon Levine, who is um, on the left of the right picture. And I put in the link to their Facebook um, on this slide facebook.com backslash or slash rise st james um, because i think everyone should follow them and keep updated on this battle that the center is very much part of as well um so the bottom line is that for most of plastic must be stopped we are part of two active lawsuits against the proposed project one is in federal court challenging the army corps issuance permits to formosa and the other lawsuit is in state court challenging the air permits issued by the Louisiana Department of Environmental Quality. And we are also, from a grassroots campaign perspective, 
working to build up the people power and we are demanding that Governor Edwards use, Governor Edwards, the governor of Louisiana, um, demanding that he use his gubernatorial power to stop the project from moving forward and by directing the relevant agencies to revoke Formosa's permits. And then this Friday, actually, RISE members will be having a prayer ceremony to honor and pay their respects to the ancestors who were buried on the previous plantation where Formosa is trying to build. They are holding the celebration tomorrow on Juneteenth. And this is powerful and important because Juneteenth marks the national celebration of the ending of slavery in the United States. It's when enslaved people in Texas learned about the Emancipation Proclamation that President Lincoln had signed a full two years earlier. And as we are in a pivotal moment in our country, I, I think it's more necessary now than ever to stand in solidarity with the movement for Black Lives and to reaffirm on this holiday that Black Lives Matter and also the Black Lives of St. James Parish res residents matter. Formosa was not going to let rise leaders on the property to hold this ceremony. Um, they're being truly bad corporate neighbors, but luckily um, our allies we work in coalition with fought back against that and the Louisiana court has officially issued Formosa a temporary restraining order allowing RISE to visit the site tomorrow and host um, their, their Juneteenth convocation. So since many, many residents in RISE St. James can trace their roots back to this plantation and others like it, uh, it's really important that RISE and community members have this opportunity to honor these ancestors and preserve the history of their community um, tomorrow and also ongoing. So if you look at the slide we're on right now, um, you can see the link to the Facebook event. You can join their convocation event in solidarity virtually. There is a Zoom link um, and yeah, I hope you'll join. It will be powerful. Well, thank you so much for sharing that, Delia. It's just really powerful work on top of like the really amazing work that you all do in general. And, you know, it really hits home for me as an indigenous person, you know, to how many times we're cut off from our ancestors. And though it's just a tiny, tiny little, um, little win to be granted one day to, you know, be able to visit with your ancestors, you know, it's important. And I hope that everyone who can on this call will join um, the Juneteenth observance with a Rise, St. James, and other allies and partners, because it's super important that we, you know, support the Black community right now and, you know, really uphold, you know, that Black Lives Matter. So thank you for that. And um, I have another question. Besides visiting this link and um, joining on this virtual observance tomorrow, what or how can our members help? What can they do? What can the folks on this call do? Thanks, Brittany. So the good news is there, uh, if you go to the next slide, I think, there are many ways you can take action to fight the plastic pollution crisis. It can start with um, really small individual consumer de decisions, whether that's bringing a reusable bag to the grocery store or deciding to make your home a plastic free space. Indivi individual decisions can signal to industry and corporations and also community members about the need to break free from plastic. Um, you can share what you've learned by watching the story of plastic and this webinar with your friends and family. Talk to them about the need to reduce plastic pollution at the source and put a stop to the industry's plans to expand plastic produ production here in the US. You can uplift the stories about the plastic life cycle that aren't always told. Um, as you saw in the documentary story of stuff, the story of plastic rather, um, this is not just an oceans problem, this is also a human problem. Communities already suffering the most from environmental injustices and the climate crisis should not have to bear the brunt of more industrial air pollution and waste so that the plastic industry can continue to profit. You can join the fight to stop Formosa um, and oppose and protest new facilities. One way to hear about new facilities is signing up for notifications from uh, state agencies to hear about new proposed projects and the permits that they need. You can contact your elected officials and your federal elected officials um, and encourage them to take legislative steps to curb plastic pollution. Uh, you can use your democratic right to vote. Always important to keep that one in mind um, and vote for climate champions and um, 
legislators that will work to stop the plastic pollution crisis uh, and fight for you. And then we also have one step that you can take today right now, actually, if you visit biologicaldiversity.org slash stop plastic polluters, you can sign our petition to the EPA. And this is a petition that insists that the EPA do its job and protect our communities and wildlife from plastic pollution. So it's urging the EPA to strictly regulate plastic factories that exist and stop new ones from coming online. And I think we can drop that action alert in the chat right now too. Okay, cool. So a lot of different ways to get involved. Um, and now is one of everyone's favorite times, questions and answers. And we have a lot of them, but first I just wanna give a little virtual round of applause to Delia and Julie and Karina and Tira who are on the tech and all of y'all for being here. So just give yourselves a round of applause. Um, and with that, so we have a bunch of questions um, and so we'll try to get through as many as we can. And again, if your question is not answered tomorrow, on Slack at 12 p.m. Pacific time to 1 p.m. Pacific time, your questions will be answered by the experts themselves. Um, so with that first question, we got, uh, how can people watch the film after today? So I did y'all drop a link into the chat or? I think we did a while ago, we can drop it again. Yeah, maybe one more time so folks can just grab that before this ends. Um, yeah, it's also worth noting, um, this is a link that expires at 11.30 p.m. tonight, um, but it is on Discovery. If you have access to Discovery Channel, either online or on your TV, you can access the documentary um, like indefinitely um, right now. Cool, thank you. All right, next question. We got, what are viable alternatives for plastics? Glass, what are your suggestions there? I'm muted. <laughs> Here we go. Delia, I don't know if you wanna chime in too, but I mean, the number one alternative to plastics to me is reducing our plastic consumption. That's the easiest way. We got a lot of questions, I'm watching them come in too about single-use plastics um, and necessary, like isn't plastic necessary and don't we need plastic? And it's like, of course, we're gonna have PPE and we're, of course, we're gonna still have medic medical uses for plastic and other, you know, our computers that we're calling into right now, but we have such low hanging fruit with just cutting back on the unnecessary uses of plastic. If we could cut back on single-use plastic packaging um, and products, that's almost 50% of plastic production right there. So think about how much that frees up to focus on just what seems more essential than a lot of just throwaway convenience plastic that is actually very inconvenient because it's impossible to recapture once it's out there and it never breaks down literally. Um, so it kind of gets into a few different questions, but that would be my biggest comment. I think the industry loves to talk about how energy intensive recycling is and how energy intensive glasses or paper products require, you know, cutting down trees and they're already always trying to say that the life cycle impacts of alternatives are worse than plastic but that is just not a road we're going down they just want to avoid responsibility and they do not want us to cut back they want to let us keep consuming and keep having every convenience when we really don't want this we no one wants to live in a world that is choked by plastic so i just answer that with a reduction response and I think there are alternatives to plastic though coming out for sure and other ways to package delicate goods that are not um, so devastating to the planet. And that kind of brings us to another question that was asked like the alternatives like bio-based plastics. I think you're muted if you're speaking, Julie. I think I'm muted again. Oh, there oh you're good now. <laughs> It says unmuted, but um, so bio-based plastics also, I think right now is not a good alternative. It actually doesn't break down very well either. And unfortunately, there are a lot of additives that are added even to bio-based plastics to make them different consistencies and um, malleabilities. So we're not there yet when it comes to bio-based plastics. They just break down too into small bits that can be a trash, you know, um, and they can contaminate waste streams. and. I, I think 
we all want to feel better about having to go containers that are bio waste plastic, but I don't think that's getting us out of this either. Banana leaves, like I love countries that you get your food from the food truck and it's wrapped in a ban banana leaf. Like that's a good compostable alternative, but um, the plastic, I think we're not there yet. Gotcha. All right, we got another question. You mentioned the build out of new plastic facilities. Where exactly in the US is that happening? Um, I can take this one. So the build out is happening in the Gulf region and the Appalachian regions. So it is mostly Texas, Louisiana for the Gulf, Texas, Louisiana for the Gulf. Um, and then if we're talking about Appalachia, we're looking at Ohio, West Virginia and Pennsylvania. So they're happening in these two regions within the US because this is where there are large deposits of shale gas and if and there's also existing oil and gas infrastructure. So it um, makes it more financially feasible for companies like Formosa, ExxonMobil, Shell, Chevron, et cetera, um, to, to continue expanding this industry where they already have that oil and gas infrastructure that can um, bring the fracked gas to these new petrochemical facilities. And uh, unfortunately, this means, although Formosa is our flagship fight, we also work in national coalition with the Break Free From Plastic Coalition and other organizations throughout the US um, trying to fight the petrochemical buildup everywhere. And these two regions are communities that are already disproportionately burdened. Um, and this new wave of plastic facilities will be another hit to the environment um, in these communities and the industrial air pollution that they already face. Industrial air pollution and water pollution. So this is um, the build out, although Formosa is our flagship fight is, yeah, it's not just happening in St. James Parish, it's happening in other places too. And it's important to acknowledge these, the other fights as well and lift those up too. Yeah, there definitely is quite a lot of them. And then, okay, another question that keeps popping up, very uh, popular question is, is there any way to get rid of plastic permanently, like burning it? I think we touched on earlier that incineration and chemical recycling, there are a lot of different solutions being proposed by industry and um, waste to energy, for example, but however enticing it might seem, there's so many terrible pollution problems that those solutions can create. And so they're really false solutions. I think in terms of plastic we've already produced, um, you know, the stats are like 9% has been recycled, 12% has been incinerated, and the rest has ended up in landfills and the environment. And I think that's a little bit, recycling has gone up a little bit in the last few years, but um, and I think right now just like making sure it doesn't get into our waterways and our atmosphere, the plastic that we do have, and that's, that's where I think waste management does come into play and is important, and we don't just give up on improving our waste management systems, but we can't burn it. I think we just have, I think we just have to keep what we have from getting out there and creating havoc in the natural environment and in our um, ecosystems and food webs. But, and then the reduction comes back into play where we just, you know, we're gonna be under a mountains of plastic if we don't stop producing so much. Cause there's, you know, there's, we don't wanna be landfilling all this waste just to keep our throwaway culture going. Yeah, and I'll just add that incineration is really harmful for communities that live near incinerators. When you burn plastic and trash, um, it poses a huge, human health risk and it releases a, a large number of different air pollutants that are really harmful for your health. So um, it's not only a false solution, it's a, a really environmentally unjust solution. Yeah. And okay, so we got around four minutes and a bunch more questions coming in. Okay, so I'm gonna do like speed round questions. But so why are some plastic recyclable, why are some plastics recyclable in some cities but not others? Oops. That's a really tough question. I feel like I could have gotten in my state and local government class in law school. <laughs> but I do and I don't know the I don't know the really good precise answer for you, but I think a lot of waste management is left to the localities and what they're infrastructure is and their capacity and their budgets. So, you know, like in Boulder, the county, um, the county's very involved in our solid waste management and, 
and recycling systems and I think the city and county work together. So I think it really is, it is a little bit fragmented in that way. And that's where, you know, some of these federal bills, for example, have solutions that would then be applied across the country and bring some uniformity to this. So I think that's one aspect of the of the Udall Lowenthal bill that is also valuable is that it does bring some uniformity and predictability for how we interact with waste management and recycling. Yeah, thank you for answering that. And then another popular question we got is, have any successful technologies been developed to clean the oceans of plastic debris? I have something to say about that. Um, and Delia, you might want to add, do you want to go first or? So one thing that I think people think of like the Pacific garbage patch as a thing, like a big heavy thing that you could like lift or like drag behind your tugboat, but it's actually a big soup of plastic. So plastic, the way it breaks down, it just fragments into tiny particles and a lot of it's deposited on the seafloor, some of it's in the water column, some of it's at the surface. So you really can't go suck it up. It's, it, it's kind of a false, no, I keep saying the word false, but it's a really tough, tough, um, tough thing to go about is trying to like pick up all the pollution in the ocean, but you can certainly collect pieces of it that are floating and physical and you can do some of that. And I think also like discarded fishing nets and lost fishing nets, there are some gear retrieval programs and other solutions trying to get that waste out of the ocean. So there are some circumstances where there is some hope for getting it out of the ocean with technology and tech. I think there's some bacteria that they're researching too that might eat plastic. Um, I should look and see where they're at with that. So that's a possible bio-based solution. Delia, you had something to add to that? No, I think you, you covered it. It's okay. Okay, so for the last question for today, um, a few people had asked who owns Formosa and specifically what country and Personally, I'm not sure if it matters country as much as what it is being done because I know plenty of countries, you know, have industry that destroys the environment. So I was wondering if any of y'all have more information on like the ownership or wanted to talk about that. Real quick. Yeah, so Formosa Plastics has, is Formosa Plastics Group is a Taiwanese based conglomerate. Um, and then the subsidiary that is running building the plant in St. James, Louisiana is is a subsidiary of that Formosa Plastics Group and it's called FGLA. Um, were you going to add something, Julie? That's just like uh, top level. I mean, I could go into, yeah. you can add. The only thing I was going to add is that when you're talking about the build out, it is in an interesting fact that between 60 and 70% 70, 70 of the 202 billion that I mentioned being invested to expand the petrochemical industry is foreign investment. And for example, the huge um, facility in Texas, the Exxon facility is actually a big investor in Saudi Arabia. So what that's showing to me is that our cheap glut of fracked gas is really attracting foreign investment because it's cheaper to turn our gas into plastic than it is to turn their oil into plastic. And so companies all over the world are looking to, and countries are looking to invest here because we're just fracking the crap out of the country, sorry. <laughs> um, and I think that needs to stop. And again, kind of brings us back to the climate crisis is all, you know, the pollution problem from plastic is very tied to the climate crisis. Yep. All right. Delia, did you want to add anything else or you? Okay, cool. Well, with that, um, again, if your question wasn't answered, we got a bunch today. There are so many of you on here, which is awesome. Um, you know, a few of us will be on Slack tomorrow at 12 p.m. Pacific time to answer some more questions and just talk more. So uh, if you're able to, definitely join. Uh, remember tomorrow, uh, 619, June 19th is also Juneteenth. So if there is an event in your area, I uh, urge you to safely go to that or attend a virtual event like the one from Rise St. James. Super important that we support, um, you know, Black community right now, the Black community and, you know, always Black Lives Matter. Um, the action alert, remember, click that as well, um, stopping plastic polluters. And our next webinar will be June 25th, which is the climate people powered movement should be a good one. You might see me again on that. So, um, yeah, any questions, feel free to jump on the Slack tomorrow. Thank you all so much.
and have a great day, evening. Thanks everyone.